Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad that you're joining me today. Uh, There's so many things I have on my heart to share with you, so I'm really excited, uh, and I want to just jump right into it. And so I want to start by kind of recapping. If you listened to my podcast, um, my previous one, we were talking about giving attention to the Word of God, and I talked to you about um, Paul's shipwreck and how really so many people can fall into the, the pit of, you know, waiting to give attention to God's word until they're in a crisis, right? And we talked about that with Paul's shipwreck, that the centurion didn't want to listen to Paul until it was it was disaster strikes, right? And so, but really as believers, the best thing that we can do is to constantly give attention to the word of God so that no matter what comes, we have a deposit of the word on the inside of us that's gonna cause us to rise up in victory, you know, no matter when we're challenged or what difficulty we may be facing, that we already have a deposit of God's word on the inside of us that's gonna guarantee our victory, right? And so I wanna talk a little bit more about this whole idea as I was just thinking thinking about this, you know, I was thinking about how it's the same way with faith. You know, many times, and you know, myself included, the Lord's really been teaching me this personally that, okay, you know, you can't wait until crisis happens to use your faith. And I really do believe many Christians fall into this. You know, you go to church, you read your Bible occasionally, whatever, but you know, in the little things, you just, you know, you don't use your faith necessarily, but then all of a sudden there's a massive crisis or whatever, and you have to try to hurry up and get faith and try to get the word in and whatever. And God is so merciful and he will help you if you are in that situation. But how much better is it to consistently use our faith and to grow our faith muscle, right? In the little things, God wants us to exercise our faith in the little things. And so then when bigger things come, it's easy for you. You can be like Caleb and Joshua. They had a spirit of faith. And when they saw giants in the land, they said, these, these giants are but bread for us. This is nothing for us. Why? Because they had a spirit of faith. And how do you develop a spirit of faith? It's by exercising your faith in the small things, right? It's exercising your faith. It's it's uh, meditating on the word of God day in and day out. You know, and I did a series on healing. It's meditating on healing scriptures when you're healthy. It's meditating on scriptures for your protection while maybe everything is fine in the world, right? But you're getting prepared. You're prepared for no matter what comes, you have been exercising your faith already in those areas, right? And so I want to start by reading this to you quickly in our intro. In Luke 17, the apostles asked Jesus, they said in uh, Luke 17, 5, they said, Lord, increase our faith. And so people can pray this, Lord, increase our faith. But I want you to notice Jesus's response. And this is his response to us. He says, if you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. So what was Jesus saying? The issue is not that you need more faith. He says, if you even have faith as small as a mustard seed, you have to use it. He's, he likens faith unto a seed. How do you get, so if you have an apple seed, how do you get more apple seeds? You have to plant it. You have to plant it. So you have to grow an apple tree. You've got to harvest the fruit, right? So when he's saying, if you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, How do you increase your faith? You have to plant that seed. You have to use the seed of faith. And how do you use it? He says, by speaking, you can say to this mulberry tree, right? So many times we're like, Lord, increase our faith. And he's like, you have to use the little faith that you have. You need to begin to use the faith that you have in the small things and watch it multiply. Watch, you know, watch God, you know, when he, as he is, as you're faithful with the little amount of faith that you have, he gives you more, right? You're going to harvest more and more faith so that no matter what comes, there could be huge things going on in your life and you'll be totally at peace, totally at rest, Why? In the rest of faith, because you've already been developing that faith muscle on the inside of you. You're not going to be easily uh, shaken by the winds and the waves that come, right? You're going to be at ease. You're going to be at peace, just like Jesus in the storm. You know, in Mark chapter four, he was sleeping. The storm was going on. He was asleep. Why? That's the rest of faith. And that's where God is taking us. Amen. And so I want to talk about, that was kind of just my intro, but the Lord's really been just stirring up my heart as far as, okay, you know, developing our faith, developing um, our knowledge of the word of God concerning health and concerning protection, 
right? So that we don't have to ever uh, be in fear in the days ahead, right? Because we know that fear is not good. Fear is demonic. Fear is a spirit. And we saw, you know, when COVID came around, so many people, so many Christians were in total fear, paralyzed by fear, right? And that's because their faith, they were not developing their faith all the while when it comes to health and protection and all those things. So when difficulty came, right, fear comes in. And so as I, I'm going to share with you from the word of God, some things about health and protection. And I believe that it's going to build your shield of faith so that no matter what comes, you're never going to be in fear. You're going to be in total peace. You're going to be at rest in the rest of faith, confident in the God that you serve, that your God is your shield, that he is your protector, that he is your refuge, right? No matter what comes. And what's awesome about this is when you begin to meditate on these truths ahead of time, it doesn't matter what comes your way, the victory, the victory will be immediate. The victory will be certain no matter what comes. And so I want to start by reading uh, Psalm 91, verse 1. And I have so much I want to unpack for you just in the first verse. And I encourage you to watch the, the, the whole, this, this video in its entirety, right? Because this, if you can catch this revelation of Psalm 91, I believe that it's going to put something in, unshakable on the inside of you for the days that we're living in, that you're never going to be caught in fear. So let's read this. Psalm 91.1. And we're going to break it down after. But Psalm 91.1, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And so this scripture, basically this first scripture is kind of saying, okay, who qualifies for Psalm 91? This, this first scripture is kind of, the main key to all the promises in Psalm 91 for protection, right? And so we need to understand this first verse. And so I want to I wanna unpack it for you. And I really, I have so much. I hope I can get through it all with you because it's just so good. So the first thing is it says that he who dwells, he who dwells. And so if you look at that Hebrew word, it actually means, uh, it can also mean he who sits down. He who sits down, he who is seated. And so, and then it says in the secret place. And so when it says seated, you know, what does that make you think of? That makes me think of when it says in Ephesians that we have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. When you are seated with Christ, right? You're no longer working. You're no longer trying to get something done. When you're seated, you're in a place of rest. Like we just talked about the rest of faith. Hebrews 4 talks about, you know, striving to enter into the rest of faith. So when you're in faith, you're at rest. You are seated. We are seated with Christ, confident of our position with him. Right. And so I want to read you this also. When it says that, you know, Jesus, whenever he died, right, he, he bore our sins in his body on the cross. He was raised back to life, right? And the Bible says that God raised him to new heights in heaven and that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says that, that having purged our sins, Jesus sat down. Having purged our sins, Jesus sat down, signifying that the work was finished. There was nothing left for Jesus to do. Every single one of your sins has been dealt with. Sin, the sin problem is finished. It is dealt with. Jesus is seated. He is at rest. The work is finished. We're not trying to get something. The work is complete, and we are seated with him. And so, you know, in the Old Testament, the priests, they were standing. They, they could not sit. They did not have a chair. Uh, where they were doing these sacrifices, they had to stand all day as they were offering the sacrifices. You know, there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. And so the priests were always standing. Why? Because the, the blood of bulls and goats was never able to fully deal with people's sin, with their conscience, right? It was just to cover over sin, right? So the priests were always standing. There was always more work to do. There was always more work to do to deal with the sin of the people, to deal with the guilt of the people, to, to try to fix the consequences of sin. But that's why it's so powerful that it says, after having purged our sins, he purified us of our sins. Jesus sat down. 
he sat down signifying that he is, the Bible says he is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. He now is the priest that holds his office unchangeably. And as he is seated, that signifies the work is forever complete. There is nothing left to be done about your sin. That's why it says in Romans 10, don't seek to bring Jesus down or to bring him up. You know, the work is finished. It says that the word of faith is nigh you. It's, it's, it's in your heart and on your lips, right? There's nothing left. Many times, oh, Jesus, if you could just come down and touch me. Oh, Jesus, if you could just come down and deliver me. Jesus, if you could just come down and save me. But really, Jesus is seated and we are seated with him. So everything we do is from a place of rest. It's from a place of victory. It's from a place of the work is finished, right? Jesus is seated and we are seated with him. So it says in Psalm 91, he who sits down, I encourage you to sit down. Stop trying to get, you know, sit down. When you enter into the rest of faith, you will sit down. You sit down, the place of rest, the place of faith, knowing that what Christ did was on my behalf. I am seated with him the same way he is seated. I am seated. And so it says seated in the secret place. Where is the secret place? Because, you know, you can read this verse. And of course, the devil will want you to think, oh, you're not qualified for this. It's, it's those who dwell in the secret place. That's, that's people who pray for nine hours a day. Okay, no, that's not what it means. Okay, and you should pray for nine hours a day if you can, but many of us cannot. We're working, we're doing things right. But it says that he who dwells in the secret place, where is the secret place? This is Old Testament language, right? Old Testament, everything was veiled. You know, Jesus had not come yet. It was all, it was all types and shadows. It was mysteries, right? But it says in Colossians chapter one, verse 26, it says that the, the secret that had been hidden for ages past is now revealed. And it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the secret. The secret is that Christ lives in you. The secret is that we have been joined with God because of what Christ has done. The secret is that you're in God and God is in you. Jesus said in John 14, he talked about when he was going to send the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm preparing a place for you a place for you. There's a place reserved for you in God and the Holy Spirit is going to take you there. That's what Jesus was telling them. And Jesus on the day of Pentecost, he poured out the Holy Spirit, right? They, they were born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. And th the Holy Spirit is the one that takes us to that place. There is a place reserved for you in God. It's the secret place. It's the place where you are in Christ and he is in you. You are seated together with him in heavenly places. That is the secret place. If you've been born again, the day you got born again, you are in the secret place. And we have to be conscious of this, right? What is our part? Our part is to meditate on these truths, to be conscious of the fact that when, when disaster comes, when, when fear is trying to come, you are conscious of, no, I am seated with Christ in the secret place. I'm in God and he's in me, right? And so Let's go on. So it says that he who sits down in the secret place, we are in Christ, seated with Christ. Secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. So when it says the most high, you know, that's one of the names of God. There is many names of God in the Bible. And so one of the laws of uh, studying the Bible is the law of first mention. So the first time that God reveals himself as God the Most High is going to reveal something about that name, right? So the law of first mention. So the first time in the Bible that we see this name of God, God Most High, God revealing himself as the Most High God, the first uh, occurrence of this in the Bible is in Genesis 14, 18. And it says that Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which is a type of Christ, the king of righteousness, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of the God most high and he blessed Abram. And so what I want you to catch from this is this is a type of Christ bringing out the bread and the wine the bread and the wine, which we know is a type of the body and the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Christ, what he paid on the cross. So even you see in Psalm 91, right, which is Old Testament, you see Christ revealed, even just in this first verse. It says, he who sits down in, in the secret place with Christ, the secret place of the most high. When it talks about the most high, we can look at that and see God the most high, 
The priests, the priests brought the bread and the wine, right? There's a connection between the God most high. How can we, how can we be blessed by God most high? Because the bread and the wine has been provided by the king of righteousness, which is Jesus Christ. I tell you what, this is good stuff. Because it says, it says that, that the Melchizedek blessed Abram. Why could Abram be blessed and God changed his name to Abraham? Why could that happen? Because Melchizedek, a type of Christ, brought the bread and the wine. The reason that you can have the blessing of protection today is because of the bread and the wine. It's because of the body and the blood of Jesus. Because of the price that was paid for our sin, for our healing, for our protection, for our peace, for our wholeness the bread and the wine amen so he who dwells in the secret place of god most high the god that blesses us because of the bread and the wine let's go on it says shall abide under the shadow of the almighty so let's unpack this part so the amplified i like the amplified of this part it says it says will abide remain stable and fixed under the shadow of thy wings of the almighty whose power no foe can withstand so it says that we will abide you remain stable and fixed i'm not wavering because why my position is not based on my performance my position is not even based on my obedience my position is based on the bread and the wine it's based on the price that was paid at calvary it's based on my faith in christ that i am seated together with him by the grace of god i have a position in christ i can be confident in that position why because it's not dependent upon me so i am stable and fixed we are abiding in this place right it's not like you're in and out you're not in and out. Oh my gosh, am I protected today? Am I not protected today? I messed up last week. Now I'm un not under the protection of God. Whatever. You don't have to worry about that. It says that we are stable and fixed under the shadow of his wings. So when it says shadow of the wings of the almighty, what immediately came to my mind when I was reading this this week was, um, was two scriptures. The first one being Malachi 4.2. Um, it talks about the, the, his wings. It says, unto you who fear my name, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings or in his beams of power. So when it talks about Jesus, this is talking about Jesus, obviously. It's a prophecy about Jesus. It says the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. His wings, you know, it can look like wings. It's talking about the beams of power that flow out from Jesus. You know, when Jesus arises, right, there is glory, there is power emanating from him, right? And it looks like it could, you know, it's likened unto wings, the wings of his power, the beams of his power. The Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus is the outshining, the radiance of God the Father. Right. So there is a power. There is a there is a light. There is a glory that is beaming out from God, from the son of righteousness. Right. And it says that there is healing. There is healing in his wings. There is healing in the beams of power that are coming out from the God most high. And so what's so powerful about this is when you understand that I am stable and fixed under the shadow of his wings, right? That means his, his healing power is overshadowing me. I am fixed in a place where the, the healing power that is radiating out from Jesus is overshadowing me. I am protected under the shadow of his wings. No sickness can find me there. No calamity can find me there. No pestilence is going to find me there because I am under the shadow of his wings where there is healing flowing out. There is, there is power and healing flowing out. And so get this. This is another scripture that came to my mind that goes along with this so well. Acts 5, 15 through 16. This is the passion translation. So understand the Bible says, like we talked about Christ in you. So this is talking about Peter, but understand that Jesus Christ was alive in Peter. It says that when Peter was going to walk by, they carried the sick out into the streets, knowing the incredible power emanating from him would overshadow them and heal them. And everyone 
everyone was healed. This is powerful stuff. This means that everyone under the shadow of the power that was emanating from Peter, which could also be the power, uh, you know, the power emanating from Christ, right? Everyone was healed. There is healing in his wings. There is healing. When the power of God is overshadowing you, there is healing. There is health for you. There is protection for you from every plague and every deadly disease. Amen. So the next part, stay with me. I'm almost done. I know it's getting kind of long. But the next part, it says, under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty. So the Almighty, I, I'm just going to touch on this briefly. I just have to. The Almighty, what is the first occurrence where God reveals himself as God Almighty? The first occurrence is... Uh, let's see, it's Genesis 17. So this is so powerful. I won't even read it, but it, Genesis 17, verse one, the first occurrence where God says, I am God almighty. First of all, that denotes his power. I am almighty. I am the almighty God, the God that is full of power, right? Like we talked about his, the, his power is what creates the shadow, the shadow of his power. And it says in Genesis 17, it says that uh, God reveals himself to Abraham and he says, I am God almighty. And today he said, I make a covenant with you and your descendants. And he says, I will multiply you. And he says, as for me, my covenant is with you, Abraham. God, the, this, this, when it says God almighty, this is referring to the covenant keeping God. And God would say that to you today. As for me, my covenant is with you and my covenant, I shall not break. That covenant he made with Abraham is still in effect today. And the Bible says in Galatians that whoever puts their faith in Christ is the seed of Abraham. We are the descendants of Abraham. God said, I will make a covenant with you, Abraham, and with all of your descendants after you, right? And so we are a part of that covenant because we are in Christ. We are the seed of Abraham. So when it says, when it talks about the, the shadow of the almighty, it's, it, and it says that you'll be stable and fixed, right? This denotes covenant keeping God. God's not going to kick you out. Covenant keeping God. We are in covenant with God. I am stable and I am fixed under the shadow of his wings where there is healing flowing. There is protection flowing out for me. I tell you what, that's good stuff. All right, this is the last thing I'm going to say. I, I just want to read you this first part of Psalm 91, verse 2, and then we'll, we'll end it there. So that was verse 1. That was all verse 1. Verse 2, it says, so because, you know, all the things we just learned in verse 1, we are dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. We're abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. So I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him do I trust. So it's, and what you, I want you to catch here is it says, because of this, verse one, I will say of the Lord, I will say of the Lord, I will say, I will speak a thing, right? Because like it says, the same spirit of faith, I believe, therefore we speak. Faith speaks, faith has a voice. And so what's so powerful about this that the Lord was showing me, man, it just made me, I was so emotional this week thinking about this, but why can you say of the Lord that he is your refuge? Because it says, you know, when Jesus was going to the cross, it says in Isaiah 53, it says that he opened not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter. And, you know, when he, when they were coming to arrest him, remember, Peter cut off that guy's ear. He was like, we're going to fight you, whatever. And Jesus is like, look, if I wanted to escape this, I could call for 10,000 legions of angels to come and rescue me. And understand, Jesus could have done that. Jesus could have opened his mouth and called for angels to come and rescue him. But because of his great love for you, because he saw you, because he wanted you to be able to open up your mouth and say, the Lord is my refuge. He kept his mouth shut. Jesus opened not his mouth. And he was like a lamb led to the slaughter so that you today can open up your mouth and boldly declare, the Lord is my refuge. He is my place of safety. He is my shepherd. He is my shield. He is my exceeding great reward. 
He is my deliverer. He is my protector. He preserves me from trouble. So we, you know, you better, when this becomes a revelation too, you better open up your mouth. Jesus kept his mouth closed and he went like a lamb to be slaughtered. He paid the price. He offered the bread and the wine so that we could open up our mouth and say, hallelujah, the Lord is my refuge. He is my protector. We don't have to fear the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Though a thousand may fall at one side, though 10,000 may be dying all around me, these evils will not come near me. Why? Because I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am under the shadow of his wings where there is healing, where there is protection, hallelujah, where there is peace and there is joy. In the days that we are living in, things may be getting difficult, things may get darker in the world, but I I am seated at total rest in total peace under the shadow of his wings. Oh man, I tell you what. So I encourage you going back to what I said at the beginning, I encourage you to exercise your faith in small things. Even if it's something as small as a cold, you begin to exercise your faith instead of just turning to whatever. And I'm not saying medicine's wrong. I'm not saying any of that stuff is wrong. I'm saying begin to exercise your faith in the small things. Begin to say, thank you, Lord. You protect me even from colds. If God is going to protect you from deadly disease, how much more can he protect you from a cold or from the flu or from something? You know what I mean? So exercise your faith in those small things. And again, like I said, this faith, exercising your faith, you're in a place of rest. You strive to enter the rest. What is the striving? The striving is just meditating on the word. You just give attention to the word. That's our only part to play. You give attention to the word. You hear the word. You meditate on the word. You speak the word. Even if you're starting off with one scripture, you know, you start where you are. You start where you are. You start where you are. And God will honor your faith wherever you're at. Even if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, when you begin to say, when you begin to open up your mouth and you begin to exercise that small seed of faith, you just watch. Your faith is going to grow exponentially, right? As you begin exercising it in the small things, in the day-to-day, you begin to thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that today I am protected. Today I am healthy. Today, Lord, I'm under the shadow of your wings. You begin to meditate on these verses. Let them come alive in you. Like we talked about previously, let that morning star rise in your heart. Let that water of the word be turned into wine. Our only job is to fill up with the water Jesus is the one that comes and turns that water into wine. Jesus is the one that causes that small light to rise in your heart so that the the light of God will flood your heart, right? And I believe that as you do this, as you take these small steps, that your faith is going to grow exponentially in the days ahead in Jesus' mighty name.